Hey everyone and thanks for joining us on Fanya Mambo Africa. It's a very eventful day here in Kenya today uh, because there are so many events that have happened in the last 24 hours. Yes. Or even 72 since the process of impeachment started. <laughs> very quickly. Now we have a new deputy president elect. Deputy president appoint. Oh, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Elected by who? The president president doesn't elect he appoints oh it's an okay that yeah. makes sense it's an appointed we have a, we are moving from elected deputy presidents to appointed deputy presidents but does that change anything as per the constitution ideally the whole idea behind making the office of the deputy president different from what was the vice president yes is because <coughs> sorry you remember under president moi You'd wake up one day and decide, I have fired Professor George Saitoti. Yes. And I remember when he reappointed him, he went on the streets during the day and said, I have reappointed President, I mean, uh, Deputy, uh, Vice President George Saitoti. Nione kama unga itaongezeka, ama chakula itaongezeka. In those very words. Mm -hmm. And he had stayed without a Vice President for a very long time. What we are trying to say is... The reason why the constitution was changed was to make the deputy president someone who is not very easy to be um, to, to be removed Fired. from office. <laughs> to be removed from office the way this one has been removed from office. Uh, so it's a change because now what we have is an appointed deputy president, someone who feels <clears throat> they owe the appointing authority a favor. But now what does that mean? Um, did the people who are the drafters of our constitution, I don't know, do you think they ever imagined of such a scenario? They never thought that it was possible to remove a deputy president this quickly. And that's why the systems had been set, you know, from the threshold of at the first 117 MPs to 233, which is a third of parliament, and then from there to Senate, to the hearings, to public participation, <clears throat> the way it had been set, it would have been, it was supposed to have been very difficult. But Kenya, as you know, nothing is impossible for Kenyans. Within a week, the process that, that we imagined was so hard is done within done a week. done so quickly. And I've said the Guinness Book of Records needs to prepare a page very quickly. <laughs> Just set aside a dedicated page and write there the fastest ever impeached deputy president is the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. Where? Yeah. And yeah, that syllabus has, <coughs> has rushed. And now today, um, the National Assembly sat in to approve the appointment of, uh, what's his name, Kithure Kindiki Professor. Yes. And now, as we started this show, something has come up. They didn't sit in to approve. They had pre-planned. They had even booked in a special sitting. Oh, yes, yes. They yes, knew it was going to happen. What I found most interesting is that um, the 236 members who sat in today all of them voted for a yes yes and none of them really i'm wondering what happened to the people who had voted no for the impeachment uh, you remember 281 had voted yes yes for the impeachment and then 200 okay and then about 40 or something had voted no so what happened is after his impeachment last night the order paper of course they read they knew what was coming to be done so you could hear names like wamoshomba mentioned and she was absent you could hear names like Ndindi Nyoro mentioned and he was absent. So basically those who had voted decided to absent themselves. Yeah, And um, also uh, the person of Professor Kinture Kindiki, much as you may not like Kenya Kwanza, he's a person who espouses a more amiable character uh, than um, the, the, the removed deputy president, Rigadi Gashagua. So I think people are coming to say it's it's futuristic. That's what you think they're working with. But you know, um, by the time we, we're going on there with this, um, something else has come up. That the High Court of Kenya has issued uh, a court document that says... Um, called justice, a court order. Court order. Yes, yes not a court document. <laughs> a stay order for... Is it, do I call it a stay order for the deputy president that's undoing what uh, the Senate impeached yesterday night? What that order is doing is they are saying, mm -hmm. do not continue doing any other activity in that line. Hold your horses as to where you are. Wait until this matter is hard and determined. It raises substantial issues of law. That's what they are saying. 
So they are saying, uh, uh, do not proceed after the confirmation of Senate. Don't do anything else. Wait. But they've already so it's, done Unfortunately, the... it's time bad because it's coming at a time when uh, Senate has already, I mean, the National Assembly has already voted 236 votes in support of uh, Professor Kithure Kindiki. However, remember where we are now. The only people who can move Kindiki from where he is to becoming the deputy president is the judiciary. Nobody that is else. the chief justice. In and particular. it is either the chief justice or the deputy chief justice in the absence of the chief justice. That's what the law says. The Assumption of Office Act. It's a very small act, 12 pages. Eh? Yeah, it's either the, the chief justice or the deputy chief justice in the absence of the chief justice. Now, the chief justice is around. The last we checked, she's alive. She was complaining. She was crying for justice, so she's around. <clears throat> and Philomela Mwilu, I saw her make comments on this the other yes. day, which I thought was unfortunate. The judiciary should not have pronounced itself on it. Uh, but however, from where we are, only the judiciary can move us to the next step. But courts must obey their own orders. You, you cannot know, that's, that's have someone... That's why I was coming to ask, yes. because the person to swear in the new deputy president is supposed to be the chief justice or the deputy chief, chief justice. Yes. Whoever issued uh, the court order is called Justice Chacha Muita. Yes. Yeah? Yes. So a judge. Yes. So will the... Deputy, um, will the, either the chief justice disobey one of his judges in an institution that she leads and she sought to protect when she came in? <clears throat> no, you see, the leading light, the person who is supposed to show how court orders are supposed to be respected is the chief justice herself. You can't be out there preaching to people and telling them to obey court orders. And on the other hand, you don't obey court orders. So from where I sit, I expect the office of the chief justice to refuse to swear in the new deputy president. I expect the court to, I mean, I expect the chief justice to constitute a three-judge bench. And I expect them to hear this matter. And then, when and only when the matter is hard and determined, shall we then either swear in the chief justice or follow the court's orders as they will come thereafter. What if they had already prepped for tomorrow, assuming they were to swear in, or even this afternoon? If they in Pilau, you call some Kenyans to eat, there's no loss. If you had prepared, the guys who maybe brought tents and chairs, maybe I'm imagining there was a garden <laughs> set up at State House, those ones should be paid their money very quickly, <laughs> and uh, to be told to come back again with tents and chairs next time. If there was food, there are some hungry Kenyans, you can call them to State House, just let them eat, they'll be very happy. There's no loss on the part of the state. No I mean, loss. There's no loss. Okay. There's no loss. How, how long? Uh, Only that now Kindiki had probably chosen his best time. <laughs> he, had prepared an, uh, he had prepared an acceptance uh, speech. Uh, so save your suit. I mean, if it's yours, you're still going to get it. If it's not yours, then too bad. How long does the constitution stipulate how long a uh, process like this would take? 60 days. Or 60, 60 days, days is what it should have taken. From the time he's completely and totally impeached at, at Senate to when he's uh, sworn in. Within 60 days, that needs to have happened. But from the way I know things, I think also uh, that uh, this matter may be heard and determined very quickly, and we are good to go. Um, would, when you say very quickly, like, um, what would... I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but the court, in terms of what uh, the senior court had counsel set Mwita tentative and dates in October. I haven't been, I don't cram I think the that's 24th. That the you know, 24th. Yeah, 24th of October, which is not so far away from today. It should be next week. Yes, yes, next week, 24th of October, should be Tuesday, Wednesday, thereabout. The court had set a tentative date for when they wanted to have this matter had and determined. I think it's incumbent upon the Chief Justice to create an uneven bench, either five or seven judge bench, depending on how they feel uh, the magnitude of this would be. And I hope they are not going to give us things like hot air, wild goose chase, and so on and so forth. And something else I'm seeing online, you know, things are moving so quickly. Yeah. The Kenya Gazette, yeah. gazetting uh, this was uh, prepared. Let me tell you, let me tell you, it was envisioned that this would happen. Yes. And they were so meticulous in the way they had planned, they didn't want to make a mistake. I can tell you all these Kenya gazettes and everything, these were things that were prepared. If today, let me tell you, you have anything, even a change of name, and you apply to Kenya gazettes, some of the times they're told to wait for even 21 days for them to just gazette that you've changed your name. For those people who know the process of 
getting letters of administration, for example. Uh, you've lost a parent and you want letters of administration so that you can become administrators of the estate. Sometimes once you go to Kenya Gazette and pay, sometimes you even wait for 60 days. But this is a special one. It happens at night and boom, Kenya Gazette is ready to print. Nothing else is more important in this country than that. It's, it's the theater of the absurd, as the deputy president had called it. Because why is it so urgent to print a gazettement notice? And there are so many Kenyans waiting for their, you know, probate, for their administration letters, and so on, to be put on the Kenya Gazette. Others who've changed their names, they can't get passports because maybe there was a problem with their name, so they do a deed poll. They wait for days on end, 30 days, sometimes 40 days, 45 days, for your name to be on the Kenya Gazette. Someone is impeached in the wee hours of the night, and by morning, their name is Gazette. I gazette. think it's a country where the priorities are upside down. Which... Again, when I look at the whole drama that's going on now, you know, on Monday we have um, Mashujade, yeah. which we expect it's an event that the president, the deputy it's actually president, on Sunday. it's on Sunday, yes. yes, and we expect that these two leaders are supposed to be together. So now, what happens? They will not be together. They yeah. are not together in spirit. In spirit, so the yes, deputy but... has to skip the function. He has no choice. The good thing is he said he's unwell, so he just needs to continue being unwell for some time. What if he has recovered by? Uh, he shouldn't recover. Just tell the doctor to add him one more drip. And it's a convenient <laughs> excuse to be away from someone who is toxic, someone who is preparing gazette notices for you to be expunged from work at night. Why do you want to go and sit next to them and welcome them to address Wanainchi? Why would you want to do that? It's convenient and expedient to sit in the hospital bed there when if they just give him Ribena and some fruits. <laughs> It's, it's expedient, it's better uh, than going and sitting in a function. And Kuala is far, by the way. You they're don't using even know planes. What... They don't even notice whether it's far. Would you take a plane in these circumstances? Would you even board a military helicopter? Maybe he will do a private the... one. Where are they parked? I mean, who clears them to fly? Who wants to take that risk? At this point in time, things are so asabic. So is it a risk for him to be there? Everything right now is a risk for him. I mean, someone who goes to that extent to expand you from your job, why do you want to take chances with your life? That's interesting. And you know, um, VPs, that seat for vice president, now deputy president, has had a history of... I even sometimes wonder whether we need it. We just need a constitutional provision that in the event that uh, the president died of maybe whatever causes, especially natural... I don't know, maybe an election happens or something. Because the, that DP post has become such a bad thing in this country. I think it works in other countries, doesn't work in Kenya. <laughs> maybe Kenya is the problem. It's not a seat I would want to occupy myself. I'm better off if I was given either DP or member of parliament. You're better off as a member of parliament. You are responsible to the electorate. This is a very, very, very toxic seat to be sitting on. Okay. And uh, now that uh, we've had uh, people uh, who've agreed that, fine, now it's official. Okay, now it's not official. It's in between. <laughs> it's a catch-22. The man, Professor Abraham Kindiki, what do you think of him? He retains his docket as interior CS. Yeah, for now, yes. For now, until the day he takes off of office and someone else will take the interior docket. As I told him, uh, he just needs to go and polish up his acceptance speech because ultimately, in the, in, the, in, the, in the end of time, it will happen. I mean, when you have an administration that is hell-bent on taking someone home, they'll take that person home. So, Professor Kithure Kindiki, uh, if you are in a blue tie, you can still get another blue tie. It's never too late. Uh, just, you'll accept, you will, you'll be deputy president at the right time. But what, what do you think about him as a person now serving in um, that docket? Professor Kithure Kindiki, when he was teaching law at the university, has been hailed as a very brilliant man. But when he started to come and implement law, especially when the Gen Zs were protesting, we lost very many young lives. And um, very many people were maimed. And Kenyans have not forgotten. And he said 142 Kenyans are missing to date. Under his watch as the CS interior. So it becomes very difficult for us to position him. From where I sit, this is a person who's got so much blood on his hand because he was in charge of the guns and the boots in the country when violent upheavals and the occupation of parliament happened and when so many young people spilled their brains on tarmac in town. 
what does it say of him now that he went in parliament and said and defended the police who did all this? You see, defending a wrong doesn't make it right. You can come and defend a wrong in whatever language you want to defend. A wrong is a wrong is a wrong is a wrong is a wrong, and it is very wrong. So what happened is that leadership failed because we have been able to manage such instances in the past. I remember one time when the most trying thing that has happened in the history of this country was the swearing in of the people's president. Raila Amolo Odinga came to Uhuru Park and we remember that place was full. And the wisdom of Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta and the people manning the security department that time, what did they do? They withdrew all the police from that place. All of them. And they allowed it to be a civilian affair. So that even if someone was shot, it would have been a civilian affair. And when that happened, those people swore themselves in. They went to town, they danced on some fortens, they messed up some breed, some roundabouts, and then they went home and slept. And Raila Amolo Odinga went to his current house, and Uhuru continued going to state house. There are times in this life when things happen and it calls for wisdom. What happened during the occupation of parliament was a, sh was a sheer small item compared to what happened during the Gen Z's man, during the swearing in. But how the swearing in was handled is what tells you that there's leadership. Because we would have lost thousands of people. They were thronged to Huru Park, it was full, they were in their thousands, there was no space to move, and they were doing something that would have been considered treasonable. I mean, how do you swear yourself in as president? Yet, the wisdom of the security forces allowed them to be uninterrupted. So Professor Kithure Kindiki has a lot to learn, but he made horrible mistakes. Those were very many lives that shouldn't have been lost. If we didn't lose when things were at Uhuru Park, we shouldn't have lost during the occupation of parliament. And so with all, <clears throat> considering all these happenings, what does that say that uh, when the president now appoints the same person to it search tells the us, second see, senior most uh, post? The president is trying to tell you something. He's always been passing a message, and I think Kenyans, you're not listening. The president is trying to tell you, I'm in control of the defense forces. And we unfortunately lost their C and C. I mean, the, the, the guy in charge of the Ogola, may he rest in peace. And he was replaced by the head of state. Then from there, the head of state is in total control of parliament, and he's proven. He's just shown you, I'm in total control of parliament. He has shown you I'm in total control of Senate. And he has shown you that even my DP I can fire in the morning. And I can do it very quickly. I can get rid of my DP and I can bring in another DP. Now he's telling you, for you, Wanainchi, I can manage you with Subaru Z and there. They'll arrest you, detain you, they'll do whatever they need to do. Now we have an autocratic head of state. He's in total control of all the organs you can imagine, including the police. And the only place that also was becoming a small headache was the judiciary. Now they don't have money. We do things for the judiciary. They owe mediators a lot of money. They owe a lot of people. The judiciary is in debt. They, so where we sit now is a head of state who controls all the three arms of government with an iron fist. <laughs> you know, that's a very serious statement. No, he controls them. I mean, is there a, a parliament? Has parliament been able to do anything? Has Senate been able to do anything that is not the will of the head of state? Of course not. That, that I is the judiciary doing what they want to do? The other day, the chief justice was here crying and saying that a judge gives a judgment and then the same judge, is, their security is taken away. So the judiciary is also not that independent. I thank Chacha Muita for coming out and making this. Let's see how far it goes, but that's where we are as a country. <laughs> <laughs> with 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 all this information as Kenyans, what what do we do or what what should we expect then? We have three years to go with the current administration. Thank you for voting in William Samoy Ruto. Everybody who did, you make your bet, you lie on it. Don't complain. Just it's a bumpy ride. Enjoy. All you need to do is find a very comfortable place to hold on. But it's very bumpy, and we are all in this ship. And there are things I keep telling people. 
You see, Kenya right now is a ship. It can be compared to a ship in the hands of a captain who is taking it head on. And he's facing the storms in a very bullish way. The problem is that when you're in a ship, there are certain people who find themselves in the kitchen. And they are munching all the time on some fruits and the meat before it's ready and so on and so forth. And so they forget that we are in the same ship and that when it sinks, even the kitchen that is in the ship does sink as well. So some of you who are seated in the kitchen there and saying, oh, we are in the kitchen, we are eating. <laughs> the others are there, they are being hit by the wind. Others are down there, they are trying to arrange bags. That's how the country looks like. So there are a few people who are in the kitchen who think that when the ship goes down, the kitchen doesn't sink. <laughs> Let me tell you, if this ship that is Kenya was to sink, even you who are in the kitchen eating would sink with it and you'd go so many feet underwater depending on how deep we are in the, fire, in the, in the high seas. So let us be cautious as a people and to always remember that being in a position of privilege doesn't make you any better than the others. You can wake up tomorrow morning and the whole ship is so many feet underwater. And you know, with, with this kitchen you're talking about <laughs> and this ship that is sinking, the most um, intriguing thing is that now we don't even have an opposition because the opposition is also inside. And if um, the whatever happened in Senate and National Assembly is anything to go by, they were the key drivers. So, so I have at what said point? this, and I will say it again, and I'll address Kenyans as I look at this camera and tell them, uh, that it is impossible for you to be an amphibian. You cannot be a frog. You're in water and you're on land. In politics, you're either in opposition or you're in government. ODM has chosen to be both, and that cannot work. And that's why I offered myself and said, I'm lead, willing to be leader of official opposition. In fact, I'm going to give you Kenyans my number. Just support me and see me get a small office somewhere and we start doing these things. Because we really have to oppose what is happening. There is no opposition in this country. That is true. That which was supposed to be opposition is in bed with government. So Kenyans now, we need to have alternative voices. We need to start speaking. And we need to start telling these people where they are making their mistakes. And it takes courage, it takes self-sacrifice, it takes self-denial, it takes saying we are doing this for country. And so uh, Kenyans just now start looking out for the people who mean well for you and hold their hands and support them so that we fight this fight. <laughs> and, and as we do all this and holding and keeping our hope alive maybe, then <laughs> what, what is expected of uh, judiciary? as an institution, because you see, um, we've seen before the president ignoring court orders before. What if this time they decide to ignore, like what would happen? The good thing is I have said, from where we sit, only the chief justice or the deputy chief justice can swear in. Which I understand, I'm just saying, the re what if it goes against that? If the Chief Justice went against the court orders of her own court, then no Kenyan would ever follow court orders. They have to find a way to, the only way they can do it is to appeal that decision. Like Kenya Kwanza can appeal that decision because this was high court. They can go to the court of appeal and appeal that decision. Then during the subsistence of the window given by the appeal, because like now, if they were to appeal those orders, and maybe um, the court, but still they would have to listen. But even if they were to appeal, and there is a window they are told, this has been overturned or overruled by a higher court, then they can swear in. So the appeal could still lead uh, Kindiki to swearing in? Yes. So tomorrow, we, we can. there is a chance that uh, Professor Kindiki can be sworn in tomorrow. Um, if an appeal, I mean, it's still early. The courts operate up to five. Those dramas will go on. I think maybe they are probably rushing to file an appeal against that. We don't know what will happen and how it will happen. But I would say the best thing would be that if he has to be sworn in, then this decision needs to, has to have been repealed or complied with. Otherwise, anything outside of that will cause anarchy in this country. Okay. Yeah.
Cool. Um, enough of that. Um, now, DP Kindik, uh, d- d- appoints. Yeah. The appoint. <laughs> so the now, let the appoints elect. I don't know. Um, the whole process of impeachment of um, Geoffrey Rigadi Gashago. What do you make of it? First, I said Guinness Book of Records prepare a space for him and put him there. That's the first place it belongs. Fastest impeached deputy president. And secondly, it's a political process that went... You know, there's a friend of mine who said, <clears throat> and I watched it so many times on social media, he said, kuna santi, kuna teke, na kuna punda. Utazipanga mwenyewe. <laughs> it's a Swahili proverb. And uh, this is exactly what's happening. It's a case of people who went hunting together. And they caught uh, the antelope. And they went home, and when they started uh, feasting on the antelope, before long, one kicked the other one out of the room and was left with the antelope, and then chose someone with a lower appetite for the antelope, someone who is ready to eat the meat of the legs and maybe the head and the boiled parts and leave the very sweet parts too. While they, and you know this person will be saying, you are not there when I was hunting, but I'm doing you a favor, I brought you into the room. I removed my fellow hunter, so I'm going to give you the legs, I'm going to give you the skin, and the, the other parts that are supposed to be boiled. That is the situation we have, of two people who went hunting together, and once they were sharing the spoils, they disagreed about everything. And the bigger hunter sent out the smaller hunter, and now the smaller hunter seemingly, and, and you'll be surprised that sometimes the hunter who is totally smaller is probably the one who caught the animal. <laughs> And now he's been kicked out and they brought in someone who is happy to be told, wait a minute, you were not there when we were catching this animal. So it's okay, I can give you the hooves, I can give you the hair if it has hair, oxtail. and so on. And the oxtail, you can go and boil some soup, but the main meat, leave it to me, I'm the hunter. So that, that's, <laughs> that's what you deduce from all this. That, that's exactly what's happening. But you know, I've seen a very interesting uh, perspective that uh, do you think maybe this was the plan from the beginning? Because um, when we were heading to the election, everyone knew that Kindiki was going to be the next uh, deputy president. Then they went in for a vote and the whole thing changed. So would it, would it be possible that there was an agreement that I will use Rigadi Gashagwa because he will convince the mountain people to vote? Because, of course, give and take, he had a better convincing to the mountain people than Kindiki had at that moment. Then have him for the two years or one and whatever, then kick him out, then bring him the man who I really want to work with. I hate to be privy to the shenanigans that bedevil Kenya Kwanzaa. Uh, their shenanigans are so asabic, you don't want to taste them. You don't want to know how it looks like. You don't want to know how they think. All they are thinking usually sometimes leads you into a blind spot. So I hate being privy to whatever discussions they were having inside there. And I even hate imagining because they are not logical. <laughs> they are very emotional and they are very... All I can tell you is whatever arrangements they made, they have just shown that you cannot trust some people. And uh, whether it was going to be Kindiki or it was going to be Rigadi Gachagwa, Kenya Kwanza was the wrong bus to have been ahead. And it was the wrong bus to have taken leadership of this country. And that's why we are seeing all the wrong things. Our health is in a crisis. Our international travel is in a crisis. So many things are wrong, even our schooling system. The schools are congested. There is super, there is so many problems. What is their focus? Impeaching a deputy president. And treating us to circuses on at night. Till midnight. And printing things at government printers where Kenyans have been waiting for their things for a very long time in record time. And now they want us to have those conversations. So when you have the wrong administration in place, you discuss the wrong things. And that is what they've led Kenyans to, perhaps. The countries that have the right administration in place right now are discussing the unveiling new airports. They are unveiling new partnerships. They are creating job opportunities from their people. Um, cement factories are opening up and so many other beautiful things are happening. But the country that chose the wrong leadership is now having to deal with problems that exist between the president and his deputy, as though they are our problems. They are not. <laughs> But you know they've ended being our problems. No, they are not. They're not. I mean, it's they are political problems. Let me tell they, you. They're only our problems because they affect how things are done, which ends up being us. You see, like now, Shif, Shah, whatever is not being sorted. 
Shakahola insurance. Whatever. <laughs> the, I, as, as a country, as I told you, we have the wrong people in place. And for the next three years, we shall be discussing the wrong things. Because you have the wrong people in place. They will always bring you the wrong ideas. Then now intelligent brains in this country have to be labor discussing non-intelligent ideas. Like now, why did we bring these funny guys, Adani, to Ketrako to discuss our electricity? Why? Because shallow brains bring shallow ideas. India is working so hard to get itself from the national grid to solar. Their plan was to have moved 70% of India from the national grid to solar. They are saying they'll surpass it before 2030. That was their plan. We are living on the equator. We have so much sunshine. And we are getting Adani from India to come and take over electricity generating. Instead of us thinking, we live on the equator. We have, we have summer every day of our lives. How do we turn Kenya into a solar-dependent country? When you have the wrong leadership in place, you discuss the wrong things. And you see, you've mentioned Adani, and I've seen in the papers today that... They signed. Not the signing. They are going to use the title deed for JKIA to take loans. Are you aware? Now, as I said, when you have the wrong leadership in place, what does our airport's title deed have to do with anything? If you ask me again, Kenya did not need to touch JKIA. Sometimes you wake up and you have pickups leaving Meru full of Mira coming to JKIA so that that Mira can be flown from JKI. Rubbish. All we needed was to fix Isiolo Airport so that all products coming from Meru and Embu would have been flown from Isiolo. Eldoret Airport is underworked. You need to go to Mombasa and look at Mombasa International Airport. Really, almost nothing happens there in a day. Very few flights. And some of the flights that are coming in are tourist flights. People come and land at JKIA only to end up in Mombasa the following day using tour vans. What was so wrong in our thinking? Why don't we fix Mombasa as an international landing? For anybody who is coming for tourist reasons, you land in Mombasa. If I had been given the Ministry of Transport today, I wouldn't have signed that rubbish with Adani. I would have said, let's put our airports on the table and let us start planning for each one of them. And I can tell you for free, you don't need a new airport. You don't even need a new airstrip. You don't need anything. All you need is to start planning for what you have effectively. And Kenya will grow. For the next 10 years, we probably don't even need a new airstrip. I am telling you, Eldoret, a lot can land at Eldoret. A lot can happen at Isiolo. And mind you, some of the goods that come by plane and land at JKI, most of them end up not in Nairobi, but in other parts of this country. So let us be thoughtful. When you have the wrong administration, you discuss the wrong things. And now we are discussing impeachment of a deputy who did not need to go. And creating Ooh, a new one. Went. <laughs> a new, yeah, and creating a new one who did not need to come in. Who needed to if you're incompetent work. as a government, even if you fire everything and hire the wrong people, you'll remain incompetent. Mm -hmm. Interesting, <clears throat> you saying he was not supposed to go. Um, maybe not because of his character, but other things. But I'm just wondering, with the way politics is structured in Kenya, what happens to Mount Kenya now? In terms of how they they carry out their politics. First, it's a wake-up slap. Bah! <laughs> Uru was telling you, it's a good slap to them. Now they understand what President Uhuru was telling them. Secondly, I've seen now they started coalescing together and started saying, oh, we are being attacked. It's our house. It's our home. So on and so forth. But also, it's a good thing because they've asked themselves, what is the caliber of members of parliament and senators we elected. I saw very intelligent debates coming from people from Nyanza, from people from all other places. I would want to see a clip where some of the MPs from Mount Kenya spoke and what they said. The caliber of the bulk, not all, the caliber of the bulk of the members of parliament we elected, 
Mount Kenya is wanting. And so it's a wake-up call for them that one, you don't vote him with emotions. Two, you don't vote for the wrong people. And three, parliament is not a reward scheme for the person who sells mandazi or mutura or whatever. Parliament is a place where you take brains that can compete for resources with the others. When I heard people talking of affordable housing, I remember a lady from the Nyanza region called, region called Bensuda. And she spoke eloquently in a lot of English and so spoke of sustainable development. And there's an MP from somewhere in Kenya, not very far, I won't mention, who was just looking at Gladys like this. And I mean, what is she saying? What the heaven is this one saying? And then she, he waited and waited and said, put the question. That's the only part. They put the question. We want to vote. The maze. So then he asked, oh, how are we voting as Mount Kenya? <laughs> so Mount Kenya is a good wake-up call. It's a very nice slap. It wakes you up at midnight and tells you, start thinking. Start thinking. Yes. And um, something else that I would want to know, uh, with all these processes, what would you make up of our 2010 constitution? Thank you. The whole world is looking at Kenya. And Africa and other democracies are actually looking at Kenya and saying, this is a model to look at. I mean, the way our Senate participated in removing the deputy. You know, there's this joke that usually happens. They say that uh, some presidents in Africa can actually say, I can, I can fire mine now just to check if the powers are still. And then I return them after 10 minutes. Yeah, I just can decide I fired my deputy, then wait for lunchtime then return my deputy just to check if that part of their constitution is working. So our constitutional order is good because then it becomes a model and a marvel that an African state would have such a robust democracy and such big debates in parliament and such heated ones for that matter. And it would have such structured procedures of including, um, you know, gazetting, public participation, um, uh, the, the, the laws of natural justice being had. I mean, it's a whole, I would say it's a concussion of sweet things because our constitutional democracy is being tested and it's being copied and it's being looked at as a model for the whole of Africa. <laughs> and as we come to an end, I like that you're saying um, it's being looked at at the whole world and you talked about public participation and I remember that I'm not sure that was public participation. Well, it was public participation, but... Two, 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 two things. Article 10 of our constitution talks of public participation as one of the pillars upon which um, the country must run. So that in everything you do, you ask yourself, have we involved the public? You know, throwing that word there was good. It was good that, so that even as politicians do things, they ask themselves, Wanjiko is watching. Atieno is watching. And the reason it was thrown in there in my thinking is, nowadays it's, you know, before, we, politicians used to do things and come and say, we've decided we are building a bridge. But nowadays, they, even if they are pretending to come and involve you, the fact that they have to think about you is a good thing. Article 118 of our constitution, and I think it's sub Article B or thereabout, talks about public participation in the sense of parliamentary proceedings and that they have to be done in a way that public can have access to what is happening. And that's why they air them on TV. So again, the fact that a member of, of the public is able to sit and just watch what is happening in parliament is a sort of feedback mechanism. Because then it stops them from going to parliament the way they used to go before when it was locked. And they would decide we are all increasing our salaries by 100%. And then the next thing you come tomorrow's newspaper, the salary has gone up by 100%. The fact that they know that the constitution has said that parliamentary proceedings have to be made public. It means that me as a member of parliament, oh yes, I will be in 2027 would be afraid to wake up and make an obnoxious proposal of saying, let us increase our salaries by 100%. Because people will say, it was done by this MP, and my clip will be all over the internet. So that public participation bit may look like a foolish thing, but it is one thing that has saved this nation a lot. As to whether what happened was public participation, 
it was a public participation process where Kenyans got 500 shillings, 1,000 shillings. So for the first time, money that politicians have been stealing and keeping to themselves, they <laughs> gave to, to the Kenyans. So some, something, something positive came out of it. But remember, we have shameless MPs. Some, okay, not all of them. Some very shameless MPs who really don't care. And with all this, do you still believe Kenya is out of functional democracy? With to, MPs working at night to impeach someone and do it and To a great extent gazette. it is because remember what we've been treated to for the last few days is what the president used to do on the one o'clock news. I have fired my deputy. And then he would fire cabinet the way he <laughs> wants and then and he would appoint anybody. I remember at some point some people could not even say danger. They used to say danger. A guy has never been to beyond class three and that guy is made minister and very powerful. Right now, the fact that you know they will go through parliament, they will go through scrutiny, you will reduce the bad manners of getting semi-literates. There was a central bank governor, I won't mention, who couldn't write. In fact, even his signature he was not there. He had a thumb. Um, <laughs> central bank governor. So it's gotten to that place because now such of those, some, some of those positions have to be vetted. And you know, a CV produced and a conversation had. If you are extremely horrible, you will not even want to present yourself. But that time you could have brought in extremely horrible people. So the constitution, has it stopped bad manners? No. But has it reduced? Yes. Has it stopped the bravado with which people do bad manners? Yes. Okay. So it's a good place to be. That's a good, uh, good place to end it. But before, as we close, maybe your closing remarks to Kenyans in all this, watching all this drama unfold in real time in their eyes. You know, it looks like it's a movie. It's a, like Kenya is a series. And and we're sitting and watching, and every day it's a new episode. So I don't know tomorrow what episode we unveil, but for today, <laughs> talk to Kenyans as we close. Um, <clears throat> fellow Kenyans, I think for me, all I'll tell you is that uh, we, not we, 7.2 million Kenyans elected for us an administration that was not fit for us. And we are all in that bumpy ride. Including the, is, the person, the other people... Yeah. Voted for. And, 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 and the one who we thought would have been helped us and it was Baba Fua, <laughs> helping them. So just find a comfortable place to hold on to. The car is moving very fast. It's very bumpy. Just, just find a way to hang in there. All I can tell you is that she will come, it will do you in. You'll find yourself paying for dialysis cash. Find something to hold on to. Um, your airport will go probably see a muhindi with a red thing here, drone on your aircraft, Kenya Airways, it's, it's fine. But whatever you do, let hope be the last thing we lose. We have an administration that is not good for us. We cannot go and remove them by force. So for the next three years, just find a place you can hold on to and just be prepared for the bumpy ride. In 2027, if you use common sense, they'll go home. If you don't use common sense, they will do this again round two. <laughs> you know, it's like medicine, one times two. So you've just maliza dose. You choose whether you want to discontinue this dose in 2027 or you want to finish the dose. At least you've tested the side effects of the medicine <laughs> in your body. If you want to finish the dose, it's well and good. Go and vote for them in 2027. And but if common sense will have prevailed, then even if there will be a butterfly on the ballot against these people, just choose the butterfly. <laughs> and as, as Kenyans think about the butterfly, um, I've just remembered, you know, you said if an appeal is made, Kindiki could be... Uh, deputy president tomorrow, what would be your message to the new CS? Not CS, the new DP, sorry. Um, Professor Kindiki, you have a tough job ahead of you. And it's the tough, tough job of doing what you are told to do because you are the principal assistant to the president. And all I can tell you is you don't have a lot of power in that seat. And what you saw happened to your predecessor could happen to you. Anytime. In fact, now, you know, that was, that was, they were trying to learn the ropes. I think now they know where they would name, not make the mistake. So if they wanted to impeach you, now they have the experience. They have the, and they've proven. So just be cautious in your dealings, but really you don't have a lot of power. There isn't much I'd expect from him. Other than say, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll do that, sir. And there's not much I expect from Professor Kidure Kindiki. He may give advice, which advice may not be taken. Uh, 
and who are you giving advice? By the way, kuna, there's a guy called engineer there who calls the shots. So your advice is too legalistic. It may not work. I'm, I, I just wish him well. You wish him I well. Just wish him well. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's a nice place to end it. Thanks so much, Fanya Mambo, for coming through. Thank Kenyans, you. sit back, relax, enjoy the bumpy ride. It's a very bumpy ride. <laughs> and <laughs> we hope for the best. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And uh, from me, I wish the new deputy appointee all the best. Remember, the oath you take of office is to protect the constitution, the country, and the people of Kenya. And please abide by that. See you on the next episodes.